Hello guys, Winston here. By now, unless you live under a rock, you've probably seen posts by people who are involved with Project Egress, which is a community-driven artistic recreation of the Apollo 11 command module hatch championed by none other than Adam Savage. It's a really cool project that celebrates the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission and highlights a very interesting piece of engineering. Now sadly, I was not one of the lucky people chosen to produce a piece of Project Egress and have it displayed at the Smithsonian, but I still wanted to make one of the pieces from the hatch because I have this unhealthy fascination with NASA hardware. NASA's attention to detail borderlines on obsessive, and it's rooted in the pursuit of both function and safety, and this latch arm that I chose to recreate is a perfect example. It cleverly redirects motion of linkages around the perimeter of the hatch into a downward clamping action. The thought of designing this door before the age of modern cam makes me nauseous, but many people smarter than I dreamed up this mechanism and made it work. There's also this extra level of detail that's not captured in this CAD model for Project Egress. Every single edge or point that an astronaut could come in contact with needs to be broken. The last thing you want to do is accidentally puncture a person or spacesuit. And you also want to avoid stress concentrations whenever possible, so things like keeping smooth transitions between faces and avoiding hard 90 degree angles, you know, the kinds of things you might learn in school as an engineer but often overlook in practice. So the real components on the Apollo 11 hatch are meticulously rounded over as you can see in the pictures of the actual flight hardware. Recreating all those details is beyond the scope of my Project Egress attempt, and in fact those details are not captured in the official Fusion model. My priority with this project is to recreate a Part 2 spec as shown in the provided CAD models and get some 5-axis practice along the way. So let's figure out how to machine this part on the Pocket NC. Based on the geometry of the latch arm, it's obvious to me that if I want to do this in one setup, I have to orient the part like this. I need to be able to hit these holes head on, so this side is the only one that can possibly point downwards. Now comes the machining strategy, and before you all come in and nitpick, I'll admit that this isn't the most efficient way to do this. I came up with this toolpath order on the fly in basically a day and I didn't try to optimize it. And also, if I had an automatic tool changer at my disposal, I would have approached this project very differently. I tend to start off my 5-axis projects by decking off the top surface first. This means I immediately know the positive y-axis extent of my stock for subsequent operations. Next, I'll rough out my part. I'm generally dividing my work into two phases, top and bottom. By postponing the majority of the lower machining, the piece will be way more rigidly secured to the base and reduce any vibration or deflection. Then I'll knock out some of the holes and flat profiles. Next I'll run two more adaptive toolpaths, clearing the material down to the bounding box of my part just to make a little more clearance. Then I'm coming back to methodically hit every flat surface I can find. The direction I'm coming at these surfaces from is a function of the size and length of the end mills I'm using. Because of the way this part was filleted, there's a weird artifact in these corners. To preserve my sanity, I decided to machine this feature as though it were an extension of the adjacent face. From my previous adaptive clearing, I know that there's a fillet in this corner that I'll want to clean up before I face this area. That residual fillet will change my cutting loads and mar the surface finish if I don't get rid of it before using a pocketing toolpath here. On the top of the part, there's a fairly deep hole that I didn't want to use my Carbide 3D single flute for. That cutter has a flute length of about half an inch, and the hole was closer to three quarters of an inch deep. To avoid grinding the shank into the top half of the hole, I would use a long reach end mill from Harvey Tool, which has a relieved shank. Two smaller holes on the side, I would start with a 1 32nd inch end mill, and then just punch through the last 16th of an inch by hand later. My longest 1 32nd inch tool has a max cutting depth of 3 32nds of an inch. And then it's back to tool 1, the 8th inch single flute. I'll start really clearing away the bottom half of my stock, exposing all the flat faces which I will then clean up with a combination of pocket and contour tool pads. And just before I get ready to tab off my part, I'll swap in tool 4, which for me is an 8th inch end mill with a 15 thou corner radius. That's how I'm going to define these fillets which can't be done with an 8th inch ball end mill and can't be reached with a 16th inch end mill. And then I'll use a little bit of brute force trickery here with different placeholders and stock volumes to whittle away the stump supporting my part using contained adaptive toolpaths. Is that overkill? Maybe, but approaching a 10th out tab with quick adaptive arcs is the only way I know how to make it work. If there's a tutorial out there on 5-axis tabbing, please drop me a link in the comments down below. Anyhow, with all of this planned out, it's time to put it in practice. 
But first, I need to bring my stock down to near net shape, because the Pocket NC, while extremely versatile, is not what I would call a workhorse. Its material removal rate in aluminum is much slower than that of my 3-axis machines. So here you see me taking a 2.5 by 1 inch chunk of bar stock down to 2.25 inches in length and near net shape. That quarter inch single flute cutter makes deep contouring extremely low stress for me because of its extremely good chip evacuation potential. And then after that's all done I need to bore in some holes and tap them so I can mount them on my ultra low profile adapter for the Pocket NC. For the most part my tool pads worked out fine. I programmed in enough margin that even though the dimensions of my stock weren't perfect, my initial toolpath passes didn't crash too deeply into unexpected stock. On the first adaptive roughing toolpath, I noticed that I was being too conservative, so after it finished, I ran inside to make some changes to make the subsequent toolpaths more aggressive. I discovered the opposite was true with my boring operations. The speeds and feeds here were a little too aggressive. For the holes in this G-code file, I manually dropped the feed rate until I got through those operations, but I made a mental note to reduce the pitch of any future boring operations. Things went really smoothly for a while. I switched to tool 2 and bored out the top hole, switched to tool 3 and did the side holes, But then, while I was inside working on some other fusion stuff, I heard a horrible grinding noise. And when I ran into the garage, I found Pavel bashing itself in the face with the spindle nose. My favorite single flute tool had been killed instantly, but very fortunately the crash had not harmed my part. Instagram followers will know that Pavel has had recurring issues where the board logic will crap out and the machine will basically act like it's drunk. The root cause is most likely a short circuit in one of the RJ45 connectors, which is only possible on my machine because it's one of the first V2 machines shipped. Serial number 30 is missing a lot of the iterative improvements to the V2 platform that Pocket NC has made over time. For example, I don't have the improved rotary axis bearings, the controller has since been made more robust against faults, and most importantly, my connectors weren't packed with dielectric grease, which acts as a physical barrier to chip ingress. Now, I thought that this had been remedied after I lent Pavel to Chris Lee, but apparently it hadn't been, so I spent hours looking for a fault elsewhere. And I did indeed find some items of concern, like brass chips in the electronics bay, but despite everything I did, nothing could revive my machine. After some additional prodding by Pocket NC though, I gave the RJ45 connector another look, cleaned it and resealed it, and miraculously Pavel was functional again. So as soon as I got home from work on Wednesday, I ran through the rest of the G-code I had been sitting on. The 8th inch cleanup, cutting fillets with a corner radius end mill, and tabbing off my latch arm, which admittedly I cut just a little too thin. But cosmetic faults aside, I am really happy with how this latch arm turned out. There's a couple things I could have done better, but given the time constraints, I think my mistakes were understandable. The finishing touches include sanding off the remainder of the tabs, deburring and softening all the hard edges, and drilling out that tiny hole that I couldn't bore out completely with the 132nd inch end mill. And so this is my interpretation of a tiny tiny piece of the command module hatch from Apollo 11. This was a really fun project for me, CNC crash notwithstanding, and a good reminder of just how great an achievement the Apollo program was. I want to thank you all very much for watching, the teams that tested, and the Smithsonian for producing a project that's accessible to us all, and Adam Savage for always inspiring the maker community. Maybe one day, one of my parts will cross your desk, Adam. I'll see you all on the next video with more CNC content and DIY mayhem.